Hi, my name's John. Welcome to another Sunday night nightcap. It's actually Friday night now. I'm doing the nightcap on a Friday night uh, because I'm going to early in the morning with Richard uh, to a steam rally down at Masham. Masham's probably the best steam engine rally uh, in the UK next to Dorset. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to getting down here and getting some decent video footage as well. Right, tonight's nightcap, I get a bit more work done on the vertical steam engine, I get some work done on the eccentric, uh, get your eccentric strap cleaned up, get it measured up, work out how much stroke the valve's going to need, and I actually start to machine the eccentric so there's some laid work in here as well. Yeah, work tonight, so she's going to come in and do the draw for the DTI gauge for last week. Okay. Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. As you know, I'm Deb, I'm... John's wife. Um, me and John's had a wonderful time in America and Canada and I'd like to thank everybody we met. We had a wonderful time. So back to where I am here, which is the draw. So one of these DTI gauges. And a bucket full of names. And we have a winner. I really don't know what it says, John. Somebody billing. Let's have a look. Malcolm billing. Oh, it says Malcolm. Malcolm? Well, fancy me not knowing that was Malcolm. Malcolm billing, anyway. Right. Did you have anything else on here? Yeah. Cool. Tidy up a bit. Tidy up, you've got to be having a laugh. Thanks for that, Deb. That'll be in the post as soon as I've got an address to send it to. I'm going to do another giveaway this week. Once again, it's for another clock gauge. This one's made by John Bull. Nice, heavy little gauge. Once again, Bob's had this one apart. Cleaned it, rebuilt it, and set it up so it's all ready to go. All you need to do if you want to have a go at winning the clock gauge is send me an email with your name. That's my email address up there. Your name goes into the bucket. If your name's drawn out, I'll post it off anywhere in the world, completely free of charge. So all you've got to do, email me with your name, automatically in the bucket. It stays in there until you win, or until whatever happens to, to me in the bucket, I suppose. This is the eccentric strap off the steam engine I'm working on. I've got the strap and I've got the rod for it, but I haven't got the eccentric part. The eccentric's the actual bit that operates the... The slide valve that lets the steam in and out of the cylinders. Uh, so I've got to make that. Uh, before I do anything, I'm going to need some measurements of this. It's got a little bit of surface rust on. Uh, this is the ideal tool for taking surface rust off. It's just a way I wheel on a, on a real bench grinder. I did have this mounted on a pedestal, but now I've just sort of been chasing it around the bench. So I'm just going to mount it onto this of aluminium plate, which is just an old, an old jig. Couple of bolts onto there, down through that, then I'll be able to clamp it in the vise and use it that way. I just haven't got space to put it on its own separate pedestal, but it means I'll be able to put it in the vise and use it and then put it away when I'm when I'm finished with it. Need to measure those two hole centers, so if we measure at the inside edges, that's 146. That 8mm holes. So 2 4s is 8, 146 plus 8 is 154, so we'll put the whole centre as at 154, we'll not be far away. We've already got a nice centre line, we'll put one there. One there, that's for 154.
it's not the way to do things like that, you'll do it your hand. This is, this is not ideal when it's better. So this vice has got two doll pins in which are a good fit in the, the T slot which means it keeps the vice quite nicely lined up on the on the middle table. There is a little bit of movement on there but not a great lot. It gets you very near and then it's simple to dial it in for the last little bit. Piece of angle now. The handle for this vase has a habit of disappearing. This is a tool I picked up at a car boot sale years ago. Um, it's just a drill and a, and a file of handle, but it really is ideal for just taking the rags off. Rough drill holes like that. It's got a nice feel about it. Somebody will use that a lot. I've seen a lot of action, a lot of work. Drill's been very nicely sharpened as well. Just one of those things that if I hadn't have picked it up, I would have gotten thrown away. Um, just something, something nice to have, something nice to use. Right, moment of truth. We should line up. One, two. Get a stick in your hand, that horrible bastard thing is here, but they do have their uses. Right. right so now I just drop that into my face like that. And that's ready to use. It's quite high up, but I'm tall, so it's not really a problem for me. One thing you must use when you're using a wire brush is eye protection. You can get away with a lot of things. I do a lot of things that you shouldn't really do 
But one thing I am particular about is my eyes. So eye protection. I wear glasses all the time, safety glasses, well ordinary glasses but they've got safety lenses in. I would advise you wear a full face screen when you're using one of these. Whatever you do, do not hold the part and the piece of rag because it's starting to get warm because of raggle wrap around there. I remember years ago when I was at school and we used to play with polishing machines and wire wheels. Uh, one of the things we made, everybody made a copper ashtray and I was a lad making his copper ashtray and it was getting too hot so he, he got his apron and held the, the tool in the apron and it got pull, pulled around the wheel and it pulled the apron off, he was alright. Anyway, he got a good clip round the ear hole for being a clumsy little bastard. Anyway, happy days. Right, so we're going to have it clean up with this so we can get some of the surface rust off and then go about doing what I intended doing in the first place, which is measuring the, the length of stroke I'm going to need in making it in the centric. See how the wire weight cleans it up, but it still leaves it, it doesn't make it immaculately shiny, it just takes the surface rust off and leaves a nice patina. There's some red paint on here, I'm going to leave that on, I'm not going to paint the engine, I'm just going to leave it as is, I think it looks nice with its, its age about it. This is the slide valve on a steam engine that I built a few years ago. You can see what works up and down. The support at the top goes into the top of the steam cylinder and the one at the bottom goes into the, the bottom of the steam cylinder. There's also a port in the centre which is an exhaust. If you're interested it's well worth going online just google steam engine slide valve and there's loads and loads of little bits of video showing you how they work. Right, what I'm interested in is measuring the the length of stroke of the valve on the other engine. So if we bring this right down, right, so that top port's fully uncovered, so if we go from there until the bottom port is fully uncovered, there, that's the total length of stroke of the valve. So it's that's the bottom of the stroke there, and that's the top. So we can go back across to the new engine, have a measure of the valve, and see if we can work out what stroke we need on the eccentric. One interesting thing, you can see the valve's free to float about. It's actually the steam pressure inside the steam chest that keeps it sealed against the port face. Quite a clever idea. There's books and books written on slide valves and timing and lap and lead, it's quite a complicated subject. These are the ports on the, the steam engine I'm working on, you can see they're much bigger and that's a slide valve, I think it's called a D valve because it's shaped like a D and that's the exhaust port in the centre. Right, so that goes on there like that. Whoever oh, did this part of the works made it a nice job of it, that's a good fit on there. And the valve moves up and down like that. So we need to go from the bottom of that port up until we get to the top of the bottom port. That's the distance we need the valve to move. Right, I've laid the cylinder on its side so we can work on it easier. So we need to go from that port fully open to that port fully open. So what I'll do, I'll measure the distance between the valve and the top of the valve chest. And actually zero the vernier. And we'll move it up so the bottom port fully uncovered, which is there. Measure the distance again. Right, I'm getting a reading here. 
0.755 so basically it's 0.75 it's three quarters of an inch the length of stroke three quarters of an inch I'll put a clock here John just to verify it and we obviously need to make the through of the eccentric half of that right I'm managed to set a clock gauge up the clock gauge is on zero it's hard to see the clock gauge face with the camera it's a, a problem that we seem to have so we'll move it from the zero until the other ports fully open which is there and I'm getting a reading of 7 756 760 so we we'll know that it is a three quarter an inch stroke that we need on the valve I would imagine it could work it out by the, the dimensions of the port and the dimensions of the valve but doing it this way one port fully open to the other port fully open and so we need a total valve travel of 0 0.750 750,000 that's valve movement one extreme to the other extreme the through of the eccentric but pretend the eccentric is a crank the through of the eccentric would be 0 0.375 375,000 so that's the offset Centric like that, that will be our center, and we need our center to be 0.375 away from there. That's the offset, that's what gives it its through, that's what makes the valve move. And if I'm wrong, please tell us, but I'm pretty sure that uh, if I make it without that much travel, the engine will work. This eccentric strap has been really nicely machined. There's two little zeros on there, so it goes together one way. And these machine bolts are a beautiful fit in there, nice tight fit. So we need to measure one or two dimensions off this before we can actually start to machine the eccentric. Basically, the eccentric runs on. It runs on that face there, a little, little bit of clearance between that face there and these two side pieces just stop it from moving. It hasn't got to be a, a tight fit, it's going to be a nice running fit. Ideally the eccentric should be made out of cast iron because it's going to be steel. I haven't got a bit of cast iron bar so I think I'll make it out of steel. I've got a bit of the end yet, the right sort of size, I'll just use that. It's not going to get a vast amount of running and it'll be well lubricated. I just need to clean that surface rust out of the inside of there. Take some measurements and do a, a draw or at least a sketch so I know what sizes I'm working with. Come on, get one. Not your feet, just come on, fetch one. Come on. <laughs> hey, I think I mixed up enough, son. Oh, 
Oh, whoa. Whoa. Wait, pack it in. No. <laughs> no, I just... <laughs> no, I just pulled over before. I went. Hey, come here. Get down, shit. Stick. Come here. Wait, just... We just want one. Wait, get one. One. No. <laughs> What's it? Wait, get has one he, then. Has he got one? Come on, come on, get one. What's this? One. Don't know what to do, John. He separated one away from the rest, like. Yeah. <laughs> one. Pick one up. No. <laughs> Yeah, good. Yeah.